So this is um, this talk is going to be a condensed um, talk in that we've got half an hour, 40 minutes sort of thing to talk about it. And um, when I give this workshop, normally it's sort of three hours. Um, so, but what I want to do is look at some of the the more um, important things you might not know about rainwater tanks and look at some different tanks, not, not your traditional tanks um, that you might have normally associate with rainwater. So um, up on the screen there, does anyone know where that is? That's Skyline? It's New York, it's New York yeah. So there's a lot of tanks there. It's a bit naughty because they're not actually um, rainwater collection tanks there, they're water supply tanks. So you, know, you, you pump the water up there and then it delivers to the building via gravity. But um, it's just a beautiful image, so I've got it right in there. Um, now, the, the Gadigal people, the one and a half thousand, something like that, they think maybe lived around Sydney, and, and they obviously collected their water locally. They didn't have Moragamba Dam or anything like that. When um, Governor Philip came to Australia, how long did, did he stay in Botany Bay, do you know? About a day. Why did he move? Water. No water. Then we moved to Sydney Cove, the tank stream. It um, quickly got fouled. And the whole history of white settlement in Sydney has been a story of not enough water. And we have built, you know, we've moved from the tank stream to Lachlan Swamp, which is um, Centennial Park. We started building different pondages further and further out, damming bigger and bigger rivers. And, and always they turned out to be not enough because the Sydney's kept, kept growing and we discovered how long the droughts can be. So we eventually built uh, Moragamba Dam on the Warragamba River, you can see there, and it really dwarfs everything else. So there's probably another five, six um, dams, significant dams spread around the whole um, basin, but Warragamba is sort of 90% of, of our storage. So that, when that was built, it was gonna be 20 years of storage. Um, but um, what, what, what's happened is, of course, it, our population's kept growing and growing and growing. So um, now if you look at uh, the, that's just a, an historical look at how much water's in the dam. So the green line at the top is full, which has gone uh, varied. You can see where it went up and they raised the dam wall. And then the, the middle line is, is half full. And you can see that um, towards the end there, that's our, our most recent drought. And if we follow it from where it started descending there in January 2017 um, to where it would have ended up, it's only five years storage now from full to empty. All right? with, that's not with no, that's like with the sort of rain we were getting through the drought, which is, it's just not enough to um, get any runoff, significant runoff happening from very dry land. So you know uh, how much rainfall we get here in East Sydney? A year? Yep. Yeah, so people talk about something between 11, 15, 1300, 1200, something like that. By the time you get to um, somewhere like Canterbury, it's down to about 900, and Penrith, it's about 600. Interestingly, the catchment's got something maybe 800, 700, depending on whereabouts on the catchment you are, but on average, something like two thirds what we get. So significantly less. Um, but our, our rainfall here is, is significantly bigger than what's on the catchment and we do get a more, it's also um, a, a more frequent rainfall in that we still get, we will get sometimes a month with no rain um, but not likely to go two months and that sort of thing because we do get some coastal showers that just come in off the coast and so if you do have a roof that you can collect off it's going to get more rain on it than what's out there. Um, so, what's the other source of um, our water in Sydney, apart from Moragamba Dam? Diesel. Yeah. So down at Kurnow, we built a diesel plant that was intended to supply about 10% of our supply, and now they've cranked it up so it's doing about 15%, and they want to significantly increase that. So if we can make our water out of salt water, we've got a problem solved, haven't we? No. Why not? Hmm. <laughs> well, the supply of water. It's expensive. It's expensive, yeah, and it's got a lot of energy. So, um, water in Sydney is very much at the intersection of climate change and drought and and water. 
So if we look at the, uh, the energy intensity of um, what comes from Warragamba Dam, depending on which figures you take, it's something like half a watt for every litre of water. So that's to, to treat it and to pump it. So, um, so up the top there you've got uh, Warragamba Dam water at something like half a watt. Um, if we can do home rainwater, we can do something one or two watts um, per litre um, with our, our pump, or it could be nothing if you just do it with gravity. And then um, the next one there is if we pump it up from the Shoalhaven, which we did for three years through the drought, um, that's something like three, I think it is, there, two, two and a bit watts. And then you can see um, the, the D cell plants running about 5.3 watts per litre. Um, now, new D cell might be something like three. So if you're doing rainwater and using more than three watts per litre, then you might as well just leave it to the D cell. Right. So we, we need to think about how much energy we're using when we're doing this. And we've certainly seen rainwater systems using more than three watts per litre. So um, yeah, D cell, um, is kind of our, our benchmark that we want to do, certainly do better, better than for our rainwater in terms of our energy efficiency. So our, rain, our rainwater system, so we've got our 1200 millimetres fall, falling a year. What, what does 1200 millimetres of rain actually mean? Um, like if, if we get 100 mils of rain, um, what would I see if I had a, a, a container sitting on the ground in that, in that container? If it had vertical sides. Right. So um, exactly. So it, when we talk about a, a millimetre of rain, we're talking about how much rain will pool to one millimetre deep um, in a in a vertical sided container. Each millimetre of rain on each square metre, as the gentleman said, gives you a litre of water. Right. So um, if you do do the maths, you can work out. Um, how much we get falling on, on, on a bit of roof in, in our East Sydney area. Now, the quality of that water um, as it falls out of sky is usually pretty good. Like a lot of people worry about the planes. Um, the, most of the planes are burning kerosene avgas. You tend to get um, carbon dioxide and um, water coming out of that. I've been told that Propel, some of the propeller planes are still running on, on leaded, so maybe if you're around Bankstown Airport, you might be getting a bit of lead coming down there, but the cars were mostly stopped burning lead. Um, generally, the, the air quality in Sydney is such that lead isn't um, an issue from what's coming out of the air, it's lead now that's coming from dust, um, if people are disturbing stuff in the roofs and stuff like that. Um, but we're certainly lucky that the actual rain coming down, apart from a few big dust storms, it, it tends to be very high in nitrates um, from air pollution. Um, acidic, like it have a pH of about six, but generally it's a, a fairly clean sort of product. Um, once it, um, so that's just a tree hanging over a roof. What we do have in Australia is a lot of trees that have a lot of tannins in their leaves. And if it comes down over those leaves and then drips on your roof, you will tend to get tannins directly into your rainwater. So that's some, probably the most significant thing in terms of the actual quality of water that hits your roof is whether or not you've got gum trees, wattles, pecans, things like that hanging over your roof because that's going to um, put some tannins in which might manifest as a, a sort of a, a yellowish tinge in the water depending how many gum trees you've got hanging over your roof and which ones they are. Um, and then that, if you're watering your garden well, it kind of doesn't really matter, right? Um, if you're storing it in a, um, in a bladder sack, which is a, uh, a membrane sack under your house or something like that, an, an additional problem is that you've got tannin in water and not much oxygen, you've got a good chance of getting some um, anaerobic digestion and then you can get some very stinky water. So that, that can compound the, the problems with tannins. So in terms of um, when we're collecting off a roof, something to think about is what's hanging over your roof. And can you um, pick a bit of roof that doesn't have it hanging over it? Or maybe you're just watering your garden and that's okay. You, you're going to have that straw coloured water. I can tell you now that plumbers are getting a lot of pushback. Like everyone says, oh, why do we have to have, you know, perfect quality water to flush our toilets? Well, it turns out that's what people want. 
Um, and if you have slightly straw coloured water and then people complain and say, oh no, what have you done to me? And then the plumbers have to come back and disconnect it or something. So you get a lot of pushback just even just flushing toilets from people, um, from the plumbers because they, they have been bitten um, by doing stuff and then, and then having that happen. <coughs> Nothing hanging over it, um, it'll be all good. Um, talking about roofs, most of our roofs are perfectly good for collecting rainwater. The, the, um, the only things we've got to watch are really um, old roofs with um, old, old paint. Old roof paint was half lead. Um, and so you could get a significant amount of lead coming off that. And there's still lead flashing on a lot of roofs, so that's the grey soft metal that if you've got a wall coming down and then some roof um, coming off the roof, that, that joint is often sealed with some lead flashing and that can also add lead to the, the system. The, the easy thing to do is um, you can just paint that with a, a sealant, like a roof sealant, which is potable grade if, if you're needing to drink that water. Um, that way the, the rainwater never touches your lead on the way down. All right, and um, so moving, so I'm thinking we're moving rain, roof, the next thing is the gutters and probably the most important thing with gutters is to make sure they have the slope going towards where the water comes out. So where it comes out is called the gutter spout and um, you'd be surprised how many gutters don't slope and if they don't, they get little puddles in them permanent puddles which then become mud puddles um, so make sure your gutters fall let's have slope towards the outlet and the other little detail um, I don't know if you can see there but I don't know if my spot link didn't work yep in the gutter you put in a, um, a spout and that is usually put in from the top and what that does is the spout then gets pop riveted into the, the top of the gutter and creates a little few millimetres high dam that also helps hold water. So a little detail you can do is make sure that you get the roof plumber to put the spout on from the underneath, from the underside of the, the gutter, and that'll avoid that little dam happening in the gutter. So that's just a little detail you can do with your gutters. So uh, moving on from there, we're going to collect our water. So um, we could just put it straight into the tank and what you get then is whenever there's dust and stuff on the roof, maybe you have a, a week with no rain or a month with no rain and it just builds up or one of those big dust storms, then the rain comes and washes that dust into your tank. So what we can do is we can try and um, divert that first bit of rainwater. And what, how we do that is with a device and it's called a, a first flush diverter. So that first flush of water running off the roof, we just want to um, send that not into our tank, and that's going to reduce the amount of sediment that's going to build up in our tank. So how do we um, how do we do first flush diversion? Diversion. Well, um, how's the best way to show this? I've got a little model, um, a partial model of one. So this is a um, a miniature first flush diverter. So um, oh, and up above it, first of all, we do some. You can do some screening. So. This is a, a leaf shedding rain head, so it's designed with a, a sloping um, fine stainless steel mesh so that leaves and sticks and whatever else that's coming down the gutter um, can sort of slide down that way. It all tends to sort of sit on the bottom, maybe eventually bits fall out, but it, they're pretty effective at stopping those, those sort of um, gross particles getting into your, into your uh, rainwater system. It's a really good thing to do. So that would typically be up um, high enough that the downpipe comes down. You can still reach up and grab it, but higher than the top of your tank. The, um, then after that, there's still all the dust and stuff goes straight through that. So then we have a thing called a first flush diverter. So if you imagine that this pipe was gonna then go off to the tank, so the rainwater comes down here, but first it goes into this pipe and it's, it's got to fill up with water. And um, it, it's normally a much longer bit of pipe, maybe a couple of metres high, and that's going to, um, it's got a little ball in it that will float up, seal off all this dirty water, and then go off to the tank. So, if our, uh, if our technology works, we'll show you a little video.
So the dirty water um, coming from our tank, that first bit, and that floats the ball, and then it hits a, a like an annular ring that seals it off because we don't want all the dirty water um, then getting mixed back into our clean water going off to the tank. Now, these um, just a little thing about first flush diverters. They have a a um, a tiny little hole at the bottom so that they will continuously leak out and that's just going to empty it out ready for next time. So you lose a bit of water and that tiny little hole can block up very easily. So they put a, a screen on top of it and that's to stop it blocking up. So a bit of maintenance is every four weeks or something you've got to clean these things out or they don't work. They just sit like that full of water. So you do need to um, maintain them. So there's a look inside um, one of my first flush diverters uh, after a couple of weeks after the recent rain had a look and sure enough a whole heap of mud down in it so that's just one little bit of the mud that's been diverted each time um, it rains and doesn't end up in my tank which means less cleaning for me to do and of course there is a usually a, a sort of a, a mesh screen on the inlet to tanks as well so that's kind of a last line of defense before stuff gets into the tank the next thing you can do um, with the tank itself is um, that like the, the sludge is going to get in there despite our first flush diverters and things. What we can do is we can um, fit a floating outlet. So that floating outlet um, holds the outlet maybe 100 millimetres below the top of the surface because that's where the water is going to be the cleanest. And we set it up so it um, doesn't get down to right down into the sediment at the bottom. If you're just watering your garden, don't bother doing that. It's, it's perfectly fine to water the garden with that sediment. It's just the dust that was landing on the garden anyhow. But if you're doing a drinking water supply, that's just another nice detail you could add in to give you a better quality of water straight up. So that's just a little bit about the getting the, the water quality up in our, in our system. Um, so again, we're just trying to get something suitable for how you're using it. So gardens uh, can be slightly dirty water, doesn't matter. You don't really need a lot of pressure. Um, just, um, you know, the, something that doesn't stink a whole lot is probably good. Um, but um, if we were trying to do drinking water, then obviously we want to have a very high quality product. So we're just trying to aim for the, something suitable for what we're delivering to. The next thing um, so I'm going to talk about is sizing the tanks. So we're all a bit um, space poor probably. Uh, a lot of people don't have a lot of um, space to put things. So we want to um, be able to collect lots of rainwater, but we don't want to overdo these things. So how big a tank should we put in? Now, that's my tank in Newtown. <laughs> it was a bit of a struggle getting it on the block. But um, yeah, I wish. So, you know, the reality is we've got um, a 3,000 litre tank, which is sort of this high and that round um, above ground, and then a, a 3,000 litre bladder tank under our floors. So six, six and a half thousand litres, and that's managing to supply 90% of our whole household water use. So we still get mains water at the end of the month or something like that. It goes about 25 days, I think, from full to empty. And if we don't get any rain for that length of time, then it just switches over to mains water. So um, when I first started doing this consulting, um, the question comes up, how big a tank should I put in? And I started off with very um, generic sort of uh, rule of thumb things and um, had clients saying, but what about when this happens, like this long period of dry, or what about when all this rain happens? And it's really hard to sort of answer those questions. So in the end, I just started doing um, numeric simulations of it with 30 or 40 years data and actually simulate their collection. And I ended up getting um, um, sort of curves of, of the rainwater harvesting. And what we use is you've got the rainfall falling on the roof, so we got our, um, we get our um, three litres per square metre, that's, that's our 1,200 millimetres a year divided by 365 days, roughly three litres per square metre. Um, I'll just put a bit out of there. there we go. So this is um, this is just a, a an output of just one simulation I did. 
So it does all, it does 10 tanks at a time, 10 tank volumes at a time. So we put in someone's usage pattern and then see how much of their, their um, what proportion of their demand they manage to get from rainwater. And you get curves like this. Um, that's, a, that's a typical situation where there's more water running off their roof than how much they're trying to use every day. All right, so they've got, um, this one had, they had 50 square meters of roof. So if we say on average, there's three millimeters of rain per day, 50 square meters, each, each square meter gives you a litre, so that's 150 litres on average running off that roof per day. It doesn't actually happen that way, but um, that is the average you've got. So you know that if you put a big enough tank in, you'd actually be able to supply their demand, which was 100 litres uh, a day. So the three litres per square metre is an annual figure? It's an average daily um, millimetres rainfall. So, um, if you were, if you were uh, advising this person and, and he said, what size tank should I put in, what would you suggest to them? Like obviously, if they put a 10,000 litre tank, that'd be great, but um, they've, they've got, you know, they've got a certain budget and certain amount of space, so you'd have to say they could put in an 8,000, couldn't they, and they'd be doing just as well as a 10, pretty much. And maybe the, the seven's not that bad, so, but maybe a 1,000 they could do better, yeah? So what sort of size tank would you recommend that they put in? Also it depends on the cost, right? Hmm? I mean, also the cost comes in. There's also the cost comes in it, space, all those things, yeah. So if they can get um, their water from another source, you know, when the tank runs dry, how, how big would you suggest, anyone? Three. A three, something like that. So I've, I've eyeballed a lot of these curves, and obviously they're, they're different shape for everywhere in the world. But in East Sydney, I've come up with a rule of thumb that works pretty, pretty well for this situation. So that is, um, if your roof runoff is significantly more than demand, then, or, or the same as, then something like your um, 30 times what your daily demand for, for, for that rainwater is, whether that's watering the garden or flushing a toilet or, or the combination of all those things. And that works out pretty nicely. So in that case, they had 100 litres um, demand per day. So 30 times that gave you 3,000 litres. It's just, it's just a rule of thumb, but it's pretty, it's pretty good. Um, the other thing to look at is that if, um, if they doubled their if they doubled their tank size from a three thousand to a six thousand, you'll see they get another ten percent, and that's very that's pretty typical. Around that target, you get about a ten percent more for doubling your tank size, which, when you look at it, isn't much of a return. So, if you're looking at a should I get a three thousand liter tank or a four thousand liter tank, and and you've done your rule of thumb and it says a three thousand, just remember that you're only going to get 10% 10, 10 more by doubling it. So if you go to a 4,000, it's not going to make a big difference. Now, if um, the roof runoff is much less than demand, there, there's no magic here. You can't um, get any more water than actually runs off your roof. And so the tank size, the, the shape of those curves is very different. They basically just go up and then just go flat, all right? Because once you get to how much is running off the roof, bigger and bigger tanks just don't help you. So in that situation, it's 20 times the daily runoff. So you, you get your, your, your roof area, multiply it by three, say for the East Sydney, and then by 20 to get a tank size as, as a target. Clear as mud? All right. So, so obviously there's a benefit in reducing demand. Yes, there's a benefit in reducing de demand, as Graham pointed out. All right, so the next thing is to look at um, what's, what sort of tanks you want to put in. So um, I just put that, because it's so beautiful, this, them building a, an underwater um, water system just using clay bricks. Um, but obviously we don't have the, the time or luxury to, to do it that way, so we're going to get something probably that comes on a truck. So I'm just going to show a few different tanks rather than um, you're probably very familiar with round tanks and, and, and more standard slimline tanks. So this one is a, it's a, an underground tank. 
So it, it looks a bit like a, a slimline <coughs> tank lying down, except it doesn't have any flat edge, so it's, it, all its edges are rounded. And, and they're designed so that once you uh, put them in a hole, um, you don't have to dig such a deep hole as the, when underground tanks were more of a cylinder. You can, it can be just a bit over a metre deep sometimes, but you can get, say, three, three, four, or 5,000 metres even um, in, a, in a fairly shallow excavation, because deep excavations are expensive and, and difficult to do. And the one you see there, they're putting it in a driveway, so they've, they've put concrete under it, which you wouldn't normally need, but um, it's, it's, a, it's specced with a bit heavier plastic, and it, so it's a load-bearing one. So that's sort of using a space that normally uh, you wouldn't be able to do anything else with. So that's just one thing about um, doing the underground tank. Um, so they typically, this, this sort of thing, they'll typically spec that you have to pour a whole, a whole heap of con concrete, particularly into the, this, um, these um, little um, holes here, just to give it some weight so it doesn't float up um, when it happens to be empty and there's a lot of groundwater which won't necessarily happen, but um, that's usually what they, they do. And the last point here is that about uh, external, uh, extra backflow prevention is required if uh, you're using that, that rainwater to supply something that's going to get a connection to mains, or it, even if you're just putting rainwater into your house anywhere, they want you, Sydney Water wants you to do backflow prevention. So what, uh, what that's about is um, your, you, do, you do an underground tank and you supply it to your toilet, say, so it's in the house somewhere. And then sometime, 10 years later, you've sold your house, some other plumber comes along and they're doing some renovations and they're putting in a new bathroom or something. And so they see this nice pipe of copper pipe and they, it's got cold water in it, so they just connect that up to, say, a hand basin. So then there's this um, cross connections been happened between the mains and, and the rainwater. Um, unbeknownst to anyone. Once that's happened then Sydney Water are worried that the Sydney Water supply might actually get contaminated because what could happen is um, uh, a fire truck down the streets sucking water really hard out to putting out a fire and that can create a negative pressure in the mains. doesn't happen very often but when it does you'll notice that no water comes out of your taps and if, if the water could get from your house back into the mains and they, you could contaminate their, um, the Sydney water mains with some of this rainwater. And why they, why they worry about um, underground tanks is, you imagine you've got your underground tank, it's got a little uh, inspection port at the top and then it's been, something's, you know, they've serviced the pump, the port's been put back but the rubber seal hasn't gone back in properly, it's broken or something. And you think what could wash into that tank then just if you have a little think about it, it say it's flush with the, the ground surface. Petrol. Sorry? Petrol. Fumes, petrol fumes, petrol. Yeah, yeah. Any, anything that's washing around the ground basically can, can get into that tank. So it could be bindi killer, it could be dog poo. Um, so that's why Sydney Water considers that water in an underground tank is potentially more contaminated than above ground tanks. Doesn't mean they, they always will be, but. And that's why they want this back prevention. But it, it can, it's going to be a great way of getting that tank in your, in your yard without taking up the space. And the other good thing about uh, underground tanks is they're down nice and low, so it's easy to get from, say, gutters that are on the opposite sides of the house or a, a garage roof and, and the house roof or that sort of thing. So it gives you, gives you more flexibility. Right, the next one I want to show you is a, a thing called um, an underdeck tank. So this particular one's made by Super Tank, and um, so sometimes it, they get put under, actually under decks, or sometimes they get put under houses. But it's a it's a low tank. It's um, <coughs> eight fifty high, something like that, two thousand liter tank. So it's a, just an unusual, like a big bricks sort of shaped thing, and. I found those quite useful sometimes for fitting under houses because you try and put round tanks under there, they're, they're quite inefficient in their use of space. So that's... Um, what is H? Beg your pardon? What is that H? H high. Uh, oh, <laughs> sorry, it should be long. Wide. Yeah, so 1200 wide by 2400 long. 
All right, and, and the last um, one I'm going to show you is a um, thing called a, a landscape tank. So that, that bit there is actually the rainwater tank. And so I've seen them used as um, retaining walls. Um, people have put barbecues on top of them, day beds, all sorts of things you can do. The most common thing that you can see there is it gets a, there's an integrated planter bed that fits on top of them, which comes in a couple of different um, heights. So you can have this rainwater tank that's also doing the role of, say, retaining a garden if you need, if, if it's used as a retaining wall, or just a raised planter bed like that. So just getting double uses again out of the space. The, the downside of these is obviously um, the weight, like when you've got a nearly three metre long concrete box, you're going to have to have a, a, a serious crane to lift it in a position. Alrighty. The next one, oh, can you see that okay? This is a thing called a thin tank. So it's, um, that's one tank there, and then there's actually another one there. So there they've used it as a screen between their carport and the neighbours. I've seen them used as a fence or just inside the fence line. And what's different about them is these tanks, uh, in the moulding there's a little um, recessed groove that runs up each end. And then, and what's designed to fit in there is a 65 mil gal steel post. So that post is going to get concreted into the, the footing, and it means that they can be constructed like a fence, so that they're supported by a, a steel post. So because they're only 260 millimeters wide, um, it's it's not going to stand up, um, no matter how well you sit it there. So um, yeah, just a very um, good thing for for thin spaces and and um, that can be really applicable around the inner city. Oh, oh yeah, no, yeah, and it's also got an integrated garden, sort of hanging garden system you can clip on the side of them as well, but sort of work into those grooves. So yeah, more versatile. All right, so that's the tanks. Um, so the last thing we're gonna talk about is the, um, how we deliver the, the water from our tank to where we're gonna use it. So the, the ideal thing is if we can do gravity, like, like those tanks on top of the, um, the towers in New York, if you can get gravity, gravity to deliver the water from the tank to where you're using it, then we've got basically zero um, energy of, of usage there. Um, I, I came to a talk that, uh, I, think it was a, I think it was a renewed talk that um, Alistair Sproul did and um, he had a rainwater system where he was pumping up to a header tank and then and it was a, a little um, dc 250 watt pump and then he was letting it run down by gravity to where he was using it and with that he was getting like a very very small amount of energy use i think it was some um, 40 watts um, per liter so but mostly we can't, we can't do the gravity thing. Either the tank ends up being too low for where we want to use it, or we need a pressure that is higher than what we can get by gravity. So if you're in a, a rural property with a great big hill, and you could put a great big roof at the top of the hill and fill a tank up there, then you could do gravity rainwater there. But otherwise, um, we need, you need, you need basically about 200, um, 200 kPa to do most um, like things like gas instant hot water systems. You probably need 100 and something kPa to do uh, washing machine inlets. So most of those things wouldn't, the header tank would have to be so many, so high up in the air that it's not gonna work. So we have to do pumping. So um, if we do a, there's, there's a pumping system that looks like, let's we'll go to that, something like this. Um, so you've got a little, a little pump and then built on top of it is a, a, a controller. And how that works is if you turn, a, if you turn um, a tap on somewhere that's connected to the water supply from that thing, the pressure drops and the, um, and, and the, um, the, the pump senses that drop in pressure and switches on the pump. Sorry, the, the little controller senses a drop in pressure and, and turns on the pump so the pump starts running. And it just keeps running until it senses that the, um, the flow, the, the pressure's got right up to, the <clears throat> to a cutoff pressure, and then it keeps going another 10 seconds. And the reason it keeps going another 10 seconds is if it stops straight away, 
as soon as the pump stops, then the pressure drops off again. And then it starts again, and it stops again, and it starts again. So it runs another 10 seconds. It has a, a, a small volume that it can pressurize up, built into it. That, that sort of system is great for, can be great for watering a garden, where the flow rate's quite high, and maybe you're using it for 20 minutes or something. And so the pump kind of runs at a decent flow rate for a fair amount of time, and that extra 10 seconds just doesn't matter. Um, but it, it could be terrible if, for instance, you had it on a whole house system where um, you just turn on the water for 100 mils of water just to wash your hands or a drink of water and suddenly getting all these short amounts of water usage and it runs on another 10 seconds after it's finished um, doing whatever it's doing. So you start using a lot of energy to deliver the water and that's how we can end up with energies up around D cell, especially with toilet flushing because the toilet systems have been designed to fill really slowly um, so that it doesn't impact on other water uses you, you've got around the house. So you have this 800 watt pump just running the whole time or when it takes half a minute or something to fill a system. So that's when it gets very um, inefficient. So, um, and then we have um, a slightly more efficient sort of thing we can do is the typical um, rain bank system, which is, the, it, rain, rain bank is a Davy product, so it's a a thing that has uh, control of the pump like before, switch, it switches, on the, switches on the pump when the pressure drops, but it's, it's going to stop, it stops the pump um, on when the flow stops. So, and, and it gets away from the stop, start, stop, start thing by not starting the pump until the flow rate gets to um, two litres a minute, something like that. So um, it's, it's a little bit better um, by not having the run on. And if you're doing uh, garden watering, uh, washing machine, and maybe some toilet flushing, the combination of all those things, that could be a reasonable sort of efficiency. But if it was a, a whole house system, again, we, we start to have something that's not so good. And then um, the last one is, if we have a, a pump system with a pressure accumulator tank, which is a, a sort of an older style of, of doing um, pump control. So what, what you have then is you have um, the pump switches on whenever the pressure drops to a certain point and then um, you have a, a tank that uh, stores some water and on the other side it has a membrane on the other side is compressed air. So what happens is the pump runs up into a pressure and um, while it's running this, this tank fills up with, with air, um, with, with water against, the, against the, the compressed air and then the pump won't switch on again until the pressure gets back down to drops about 100 um, kPa before it cuts in again. So that the water basically is always getting delivered by pre compressed air. And what you get is if you've got say a, um, an 18 litre tank, you'll get about um, a 6 litre drawer off we call it, so it'll deliver 6 litres of water without the pump starting in. Then the pump will start up and in a few seconds it'll, it'll repressurise. So it means that the pump runs less often and um, it, it goes at it moves more volume while it's running. So it, it just improves the efficiency pretty dramatically from the other methods of control. So that's, that's the sort of thing you do if um, you're doing a whole house system um, where you've got lots of turn-ons. You don't want the pump just going every time someone washes their hands. You just want that compressed air delivering it out. And I meant to show you um, this just you know, garden tap on the side of the tank. You know, gravity is a great way to, to do it if you can. So um, this is the, the rain bank sort of system. And this is, so this is uh, something you can just go to a pump supplier and say, I'm going to do a garden, laundry, um, washing machine. Um, what's, what do I need? And I say, oh, we get one of these things. And it'll, it'll turn your pump on, switch it off. It'll do the main switch over, so when there's um, no, rain, no water in your tank, it'll switch over to mains water. So lots of neat things. Um, they have proved to be not as reliable as I would like. Like I've, um, they, they have a certain sort of failure rate, which I, I think comes 
part, especially when something's not very well used. So I think with regular use, they tend to um, go okay. Um, if they get left uh, unused for a significant period of time, I think that's when they start to suffer a bit. And the other thing is that they, they don't handle um, some of the coarse part particles that a, that a standard rainwater pump can handle. So for instance, if you've got a plastic tank and then the installers drill holes in it to put in a, a tank gauge or something, there's little tiny bits of plastic that float around in the water. If they get into these things, it tends to kill them. Um, so a really good thing to do is you just put a Y strainer um, between the pump and the and the, um, the this this device because this this thing's worth about four hundred dollars to replace, but that's not the expensive bit. The expensive bit's getting the plumber to come out and, and do the work and replacing it and that. Um, if you just put this Y strainer and it's just got fine um, stainless steel mesh in there, it'll protect it. And, and you find all the manufacturers will recommend it as well, even though they'll, they'll have these images of bolting it straight on the pump, they all recommend that you do put some sort of Y strainer in between there. If, um, if you're going to uh, like a whole house system, that's, this is, your, uh, this is the, the pressure tank sort of system with a, um, that's a, that's a pressure switch sitting under it that just tells the pump to turn on and off and you set it up with, with a gap. So you do get the pressure goes up and down a little bit, but um, it can be set up to be pretty acceptable. And then I would use um, with that, this um, Beltrami Aquasaver, Aquasaver for the switch over between mains and, um, between mains water and rainwater. So this is just a purely hydraulic Thing. So you have mains water coming in here and rainwater in here and, and one or the other coming out. And as long as the rainwater pressure is, is higher than the mains water pressure, you'll get rainwater um, coming out. But it's, it's also got some little feedback stuff in here that makes, it uses, a, the way these valves work, uses um, the pressure from the rainwater and it sort of amplifies it to shut off the, the mains water. But, no electricity, so these things are much more reliable than the sort of electronic based ones. And they don't have the sort of little um, flow switches and things in there that can be fouled by some coarse material. But this sort of stuff costs a lot more than the sort of package units you can get. All right, so that's, that's kind of something about the water supply stuff. Um, but that, um, Getting the energy down less than desal is, is something we do need to think about because um, we've certainly had systems that have been well up above that. Um, if we don't look at stuff like uh, pressure accumulated tanks for whole house systems particularly. Okay, just the last thing I'm gonna talk about is post filtering. <coughs> so generally I'd just say don't, don't filter your water on delivery. If, if you're doing, you know, you're watering your garden, it obviously doesn't need filtering. If you've got a good collection system, so all those things, leaf screening um, on the on the downpipe, like um, this this sort of thing, first flush diverter, you're doing your maintenance. Um, you should also be fine then for um, toilet flushing and and washing machine. So in our house, you know, we don't have any pre-filtering on any of those things, and and have had no problem whatsoever. But as I said. Plumbers have had people complaining about the colour of the water in their toilets and things like that. And if if it is if it is quite silty, what's coming through, it will start messing with valves and things. But if you've got a, a you know reasonably good clean roof and your collection system works well, you should be able to do it with no filtering at all. The times I start talking about filtering is if you're doing a whole house system or most of house system. So, for instance, if you're going into a storage hot water system. If you don't do sediment filtering before it goes into the hot water system, then you will get the sediment will settle in your hot water tank. Um, and then some hot water tanks have a way to clean it out, but um, plenty don't. So that's something, one reason to do it. Um, and the other thing is if you're drinking the water, then you need to, um, the, the sort of, the, the gold standard really in, in water filtration is sub one micron absolute. So even if you were going to do um, UV disinfection, which I don't recommend because it uses way too much energy, um, you still are required. You know, you still need to do sub one micron um, filtering. 
And that, that can be done simply by a ceramic filter like this. And that's, um, you want it to be just on the cold water side of um, your kitchen sink and cold water side of your, your bathroom basin. And um, because, because it's so fine, it's gonna re it, it reduces the flow rate a lot. So we don't wanna, we don't wanna push much water through it. Um, and it also means it would clog really fast if we put you know, lots of water through it. So we just wanna put as little water through it as possible, just, that, just the drinking water um, if we can. But the other thing about that is um, we can reduce we can reduce the rate that it that it clogs up by putting um, pre-filtering um, onto the the house supply. So something like this um, a, a twin big blue um, filter. So they're, they're really big filters, um, and you do a 20 micron and a 5 micron, and what you get from that is a uh, you're just taking most of the sediment out, and it means that you your drinking water filters don't have to they have to handle so much so they they clog a lot um, more slowly um, and that's the delivery of it